Now we are delving straight into the economy of Nigeria. You know, Nigeria needs a lot of support it can get for us to rank to the top. And we have to do that with money. We need more investors to come in. You need to shake your pocket. You need to have for yourself and enough to give to yourself, to your family, to your society. So right about now, it is the economy. I'll take you to Professor Pat Otomi to do justice. Well, thank you so very much, Adebuni. Uh, the question of the state of the Nigerian economy is central to everything. Security, the basics of healthcare, like we've talked about, everything revolves around the economy. Uh, one American presidential candidate who became president said, Listen, listen, is the economy stupid? <laughs> it's, it's the economy. Everything revolves around the economy. Uh, one of the things that we have done wrong in Nigeria is we have got the economy quite wrong. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to set the tone from the manifesto. Um, uh, joining us via Zoom, uh, two professors from uh, the Lagos Business School, uh, Franklin Ngu and Bongo Adi. Uh, perhaps I should ask uh, that they provide a brief summary of the position in the manifesto on the economy. Uh, maybe we'll go first with Bongo. Is, is Bongo there? I'm here. OK, Bongo. What, yes. in summary form, does the manifesto say about how to get this engine cracking again. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. And welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, uh, program. Yeah. Um, like, just as Prof said, everything revolves around the economy. And then the manifesto took its departure from the state of the econ economy. Um, what we have today is a rentier, rentier um, economic system, you know, where... Uh, you know, you, it's difficult actually to place Nigeria's economy uh, on the spectrum of uh, economic models. Um, some people will say we have a mixed economy, but if you follow what has been going on in the past few years, you will know that uh, it is neither here nor there. We are more like a socialist uh, system where the government retook the commanding height of the economy. Not because it had any good uh, interest or any sort of, uh, uh, will I say, uh, um, you know, the interest of the people at heart to begin to allocate resources in an efficient manner. By the way, government has never been a good allocator of resources. But that is what we have seen happen in our economy in the past um, seven to eight years now. So where the government took over the commanding heights of the economy, by uh, you know, trying to reallocate resources, uh, so creating all manner of subsidies. So we now have a misaligned macroeconomic uh, system. The fiscal buffers have nothing, um, you know, um, in connection, uh, you know, with the the, the uh, planks, other economic uh, planks. So we have a situation where uh, the fiscal is running uh, at its own pace. Uh, whether it's running or not uh, is also something up for debate. And then the macroeconomy is also on its own um, uh, levers. So at the end of the day, um, as we've uh, noticed, the macroeconomy has no longer any control on the economy. So what do I mean by that? You've seen the, uh, the central bank raising rates, uh, which is uh, targeted at uh, curtailing inflation and things like that. But we've seen that uh, macroeconomic policy over the years have become sterile. They are in a, they've been, become unable to effect any sort of change or to correct the anomalies in the economy. Why did that happen? It's simply because of the way the government has managed the economy, a subsidy-driven economy, a rentier system, so which benefits just a few people. Um, there is no efficiency in the system. So our manifesto started from there. Now, the first thing that will happen is that we have to dismantle all these, um, you know, uh, structures of systems of subsidy. Well, they are not actually subsidy. So let's call them rent-seeking systems because 
if it is subsidy, you will now be looking at, okay, the question will be who is benefiting from the subsidy or who is the subsidy helping? Because if you subsidize a product or a service or any sort of good, as we have with uh, uh, petroleum, uh, you know, the fuel, the PMS, when we subsidize it, the, the target will be to help uh, the poor, help small businesses. But then you notice that uh, those people are not the beneficiary of that subsidy. So the subsidy is still hijacked by the same rent-seeking system. So it doesn't work. So the first thing the manifesto, the government uh, of the day would do is to dismantle all those systems. So when those systems are dismantled, revenue will begin to flow back to the coffers of the government. Uh, because what we have right now, apart from the huge debt overhand, remember before 2015, Nigeria was not um, you know, a highly indebted poor country that it has become today. Uh, by 2005, we got ourselves off the debt hook, okay? And then that actually set the economy on a new new uh, spiral of growth. So for consistently for over 10 years or about 10 years, a decade, that is during the Obasanjo and then the beginning uh, period of Jonathan's uh, regime, we had a sustained economic growth of, uh, that averaged 6%. That was because we were kind of tending towards a market-driven system where uh, uh, demand and supply and the price system kind of uh, determine the allocation of resources. That really worked and benefited the economy. Uh, most Nigerians in diaspora actually started, in fact, we had a reverse brain drain. People started coming back for Ni to Nigeria because uh, Nigeria started looking, at, I, mean, I mean, holding very positive prospects for prosperity, for well-being, and for people to meet their aspirations. So we had our people coming from all parts of, 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 of the globe to take up uh, positions in Nigeria. But well, that, of course, that frittered away by 2015 when the current administration came to power. Now, they started to pursue what I call a socialist uh, system, so which started to disrupt the market to create distortions all over the place. So whether in the fiscal system or in the macroeconomic system, we had that you know, overriding ambition of, of, of populism. So populist, populist uh, policies never helped anybody. So that is the first thing that the manifesto uh, tackled. And then what the, our administration will do as soon as our, our, our president you know, comes into power, we have to dismantle all those systems you know, to liberate the, the, the economy from the stranglehold of, uh, of rent-seeking. So once that is done, so we are sure that we can now have the revenue to begin to build up all the critical, the necessary, uh, you know, things uh, within the economic system. So uh, let me let me leave it there. So the first thing is that the macroeconomic, um, you know, mainstreaming, we are going to dismantle the system of rent seeking, okay? Which of course is what fuels corruption. So once we tackle that, we are sure that corruption will be reduced by about twenty five percent. Do not forget that our principles say that, okay, if he gets into power, if he's not stealing, his uh, wife is not uh, corrupt, and then his family is not corrupt, and those around him are not corrupt, uh, corruption will reduce by 50%. So when we dismantle the rent-seeking system that we have in the macroeconomic uh, you know, angle, corruption will further reduce by 25%. So we now have 25% to deal with, and that will be handled through institutional reforms that we have also proposed. So I, I will leave it at, at that point, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Bongo. Um, uh, Franklin, uh, is Franklin um, in a position to join us right away to um, look at the points of emphasis, the certain things that must be emphasized if you are to get a, an economy go from what is often described as consumption to production. Uh, to go away from rent-seeking, as Bongo has uh, shown, which is at the heart of the Nigerian economy. Most of the choices that are made are made to advance the extraction of rent by a certain privileged group. That's simply the basis of policymaking in Nigeria today. Now, if you are going to stop the hemorrhage, cut rent-seeking, if you are going to cut your coat according to your cloth, as General Basson just said many, many years ago, instead of continuing in this profligate manner when your revenues are declining, oil stealing is preventing you from earning as much as you should, etc., etc. What should be the emphasis? What are the focus points? 
uh, before we then come to uh, a general conversation around economic strategy. Yeah, Franklin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you can you can see me and you can hear me. Um, in terms of just taking up from what, where Professor Bungo stopped, is that the key thing that needs to be done is, of course, for you to revive an economy, we have to look at three policy directions. One is the monetary policy, two is the physical policy, and three is the supply side policies. So, of course, we all agree that in this last, um, uh, in this current regime, this, it seems that the fiscal policy side has been on the back seat. And that's why it seems like the monetary policy under the CBN is more or less pursuing both monetary policy and as well as fiscal policy and even supply side policies. So I think the key thing that we need to do to start reviving the economy is first of all that the monetary, uh, monetary policy institution, which is the CBN, should focus more on its core responsibility. And the fiscal policy side should also be up and running with regard to what they are supposed to do. And there has to be a clear harmony between the two in terms of how do they drive uh, Nigerian economy revival. And of course, the need for also to attend to the supply side policies. But on top of that, there are three or four things that needs to be done urgently. One is how do we, as we are actually pointed out before, how do we urgently remove the subsidy? As we all know, subsidy for the year will take almost six point something trillion. So even if you remove subs if you remove subsidy, it means that you have about six trillion that you can reallocate to education, health, which would definitely revive the help in terms of reviving the economy. As uh, the, uh, we already we also know, the difference between the rich and poor countries mainly lie on education and health, which is human development index. In addition to removing the subsidy, we also look at the cost of governance in Nigeria in terms of how do we re significantly reduce it. Interestingly, it's been said that some people are stingy, some people are not stingy. So some people are, uh, Mr. Peter B is now saying that Nigeria needs a stingy person because he's going to manage the economy prudently in terms of managing public resources efficiently. So in addition, so we've mentioned the subsidy, removal of, uh, removal of the subsidy, then reducing the cost of governance. Then also in terms of how do we start looking at the issue of insecurity. If we're able to tackle insecurity very well, it means that our mainstay of our GDP of the economy, which is agriculture, will be properly and properly revived. It means that people can go back to the farms. It means that people can now start farming properly. It means that output in the agricultural sector will now come up, which will also link to the mantra of emphasizing moving from consumption to production. Because even if we are, uh, if we are good in agriculture, it means that the agricultural outputs will now be used in other sectors of the economy so that we can now start moving from, will I say, first industrial revolution to second to third and possibly to fourth industrial revolution, which is also in the manifesto as well. So these are a few things that need to be done urgently. So at least in the first few few months of the administration, if if uh, if they if it comes in to start reviving the economy. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Prof. Thank you, thank you, Franklin. Uh, I've got um, Mr. Maduka and uh, Dr. Nwese here with me, and uh, the big question is. Some people think the task is too daunting. I mean, things are so far gone, so bad, that, ah, can anybody fix this? But what are your thoughts on saving the Nigerian economy? Are, are things too far gone? <laughs> what? Uh, perhaps we can start. <laughs> okay. Can start. Yes. Um, no, of course, things are not too far gone. Okay. Uh, if you look at countries like Rwanda, at some point, you must have felt it was completely over. Mm -hmm. you know, but look at them today, they're the stars of the continent. Everybody's going there, everybody's looking to them for um, direction. So, no, we're not too far from um, There's hope, which is really why we're sitting here. Right. Right. So, we're going to build on that hope and then mm -hmm. restart our country, restart our economy. 
Yeah, and I, and I think that, um, like uh, Franklin mentioned, one of the points he mentioned was the security. And um, if um, nobody is going to uh, invest in a hostile uh, uh, environment, and um, uh, we need to raise, and uh, what I see in Peter B doing in all his trips overseas and all that, is to build confidence. And the economy thrives on confidence. Investment can only happen when there is confidence in the economy. If I'm confident that money will come in, my, in the next month, I can spend what I have now. But if I'm not sure of what's going to happen, I can <coughs> hold on to what I, I have. So yeah, we need that investment and all that. Like in the 90s, um, a, a nosy journalist asked a Belgian, a Belgian ambassador to Nigeria, why Belgian investors are not investing in Nigeria. He said to the journalist, when Nigerian, middle, when Nigerian rich men begin to invest in Nigeria, have the confidence to invest in Nigeria, then foreigners will join suit. So it will encourage domestic investors as well. And, and this is very, very important because, I mean, investment is a function of capital. Mm. You have to have capital to invest and then generate the growth and so on and so forth. But we find that savings don't seem to figure in the yeah. consciousness of today's leading policy makers. That's right. I mean, I thought that the idea of referring to uh, Peter Rubi as stingy yeah. was the silliest thing <laughs> that shows people don't understand how yeah. economies grow. Yeah. You know, to say, ah, the man is stingy, he saved money. Yeah. Why didn't he use it for the people? Yeah. It's, did the quality of life of the people get any worse from what was done with the money that was spent? Now, there's a famous uh, uh, economist at Columbia University back in the 50s called Ragnar Noxe. And his mantra was, Capital is made at home. Yeah. All this foreign uh, investment we are praying for and hoping does not come in really happens, like the Belgian ambassador said, yes. when there's domestic savings and investment and they see the opportunity and then they, they rush in. But there has been almost irresponsibility in the way that most of those in the current order think of public resources. Mm. Spend, spend, spend. No consciousness of savings. To compound that, still on this issue of capital, we have the fact that a lot of the assets we have can be converted to capital. Yes. You know, as Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, likes to preach, we have a lot of dead assets, assets yeah. dead capital. We know we are assets because simple things like having a proper representational system, we use this language, but let's call it a land registry, yeah. where you can buy and sell houses yeah. without any problem, mm -hmm. so people can lend you against any kind of land asset, for example, that you have. We've been preaching this for years. State governments have not managed to improve those representational systems, not realizing that it's a critical part of how capital formation takes place. So you look at these problems, and you can even go further uh, uh, on that, the way that um, our regulators manage things that reduce confidence. And then finally, a very big issue, uh, 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 Ayo Teriba likes to emphasize this point. Most of the inflow of resources into countries like Brazil, India, China, comes from having an asset register that is available to the world in a way that the world can bring in capital to develop those assets. Mm -hmm. Give a simple example. Here in Lagos, there is a national secretariat that was abandoned yeah. 30 something years ago. It is still a like wasting that. asset. That's right. Whatever the legal issues, whatever, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter. If we, if we think we're, we're serious people, we should have sorted the, whatever the uh, issues are hundreds, literally thousands of such assets are doing nothing around the country. Whereas if we listed them, we did the right thing for the regulatory environment, literally billions of dollars will come in. Let's take that national uh, secretariat, for example. Can you imagine people bringing in two, three billion dollars to convert that place into some, let's even call it a hotel or whatever complex. Mm -hmm. You know how many thousands of Nigerians will get jobs there? Yeah. You know, so this failure to think about 
it is part of failure of development. Yeah. Uh, mm. Prof, sorry. Mm. I, I just uh, recall, you know, the Singapore thing. You know, when I visited the Singapore and the study tour, you know, there was, um, you know, this issue of savings, which you rightly mentioned, that government is so, like for savings. For savings is at the heart of Singapore's development. Yes. And then that for savings, you know, made people to become conscious of their own lifestyle. Yes. From when you are a single person, you graduate mm -hmm. from university at 21, mm -hmm. you get a job, mm -hmm. government will force you to begin to save. Mm -hmm. Once you're 25, you move to an, an apartment, a, a, sing, a, a, a one bedroom apartment. When you begin to have children, you move to a bigger apartment and all that. Mm -hmm. So they plan their destiny like that. And I think that is what uh, the government of P2B is also uh, planning Absolutely. to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To survive. Yes, he has to survive. Yeah. <laughs> so true. So true. The thing is that one commitment of the Obi Dati push is to increase wages. And you take, like, like the police force, as a classic example, I cannot imagine that a policeman should earn less than 100,000 naira as basic wage. I really personally can't imagine that. But policies then facilitate people who now end better, and it's not just people, but institutions, to save. If you look at the Singapore story, all of the things they did in Singapore, we actually tried to do. At the same time, I was failed woefully, they have succeeded remarkably. National Housing Fund, where is the money? It was the HDB. Housing Development Board of Singapore, and the savings that were forced that led to most of the major investments in this Durang uh, Industrial Park and all of those and all of those. But what happened? Because of corruption, I'm trying to make people understand why fighting corruption is such an important thing. Because of corruption, the same initiative at the same time in Nigeria failed massively. Suddenly, we couldn't find the money for the national housing scheme. But Singapore took it as forced savings, invested, and grew their economy. So there's a relationship that Nigerians need to understand and own the change that is desired for this economy to grow. And, and uh, Prof, uh, we saw that um, uh, we had um, a Budukato Ranch for two weeks mm. on the um, um, uh, this uh, program that we, we had for uh, scenario planning so in Nigeria 2025. And we came out with uh, three scenarios. You made a presentation that was part of the you know, logistics and all that. So, and at the, out of that, we had, um, you know, we observed that we had never had opportunity, Nigeria never had opportunity of having someone that understands the economy in the helm of affairs, a president that understands the economy. You know, unlike other countries that, even though they don't understand, but they can learn about it, but no, none of them are willing to. The only person that even tried was a passenger, you know, that tried to understand the economy. So we said, okay, by 2025, this is the way. If we are lucky to have uh, an entrepreneurial uh, leader, a president, then the economy can grow by 10, 15 percent. Then if we are also lucky to have uh, autocratic, benevolent uh, autocrat like a Singapore mandate, we're also going to have, uh, you know, um, uh, some growth. Then, you know, but the other one is going to do it Somalia. But what I'm saying is that for the first time, we are going to have, by the grace of God, a president that understands the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to try and move on to other aspects very quickly because people are waiting for us. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Jerry Okolo to talk about 
power and economic development. Uh, but in terms of general strategy, uh, the manifesto captures a commitment to a strategy to move from consumption to production, which looks at agriculture. A good part of Nigeria, in northern parts of Nigeria, endowed with land area that is fertile. The threat of the rivers becoming opportunity through damming the Benue and Niger rivers in ways that will, instead of flooding and killing our people, we will have irrigated all season farming across these places, boost agriculture in a dramatic way, and begin to transfer them in industrial parks across the country into products yes, that can be exported, consumed locally, improve the quality of lives of people. I think that there are a, a sense for this as the real crucible of how you turn around an economy that is in trouble. That's right is what we need to go on to by uh, turning to um, a fundamental thing for building a manufacturing economy, mm. power. Um, if we said, um, perhaps we can take Jeremy Okolo on power. The manifesto paid a lot of attention to how we can get power up and running. Nigeria has had a, an almost tragic experience with generating power. Um, is it, it's, it's, uh, are we ready to bring Jerome on uh, 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 to, uh, on power? Uh, because you see, for years I, I hosted in an annual conference on power, and I, I keep talking about how when the late engineer Joe Makoju and um, and Lily Moke were essentially the focal persons on power. They came to one of those conferences at the Lagos Business School on power. And they said, and never forget that, comparing us to South Africa, that on a per capita basis, if we were to just reach the South African level, and this was like 20 years ago, Nigeria needed to actually generate 88,000 megawatts of power. And today we're still talking about 5,000, the three walk. Oh, we can actually generate six, possibly, but uh, the, 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 this anyway, kind of stuff we hear every day. And we've seen Egypt just do dramatic things in raising power past 50 something thousand megawatts with you know, population significantly, half of ours, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, power is therefore a crucial part of this economic conversation. Um, so are we ready to take J Jerome on? Uh, Dr. Je okay. Yeah. Dr. Jerome Okolo is the focal person in our review, uh, 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 policy review and future view team. And um, he has um, tried to summarize the um, power discussion in the manifesto, and then we'll be joined by uh, a few other uh, people with expertise, including, and this is very interesting, we're going to bring on from the United States a power sector investor to reflect on the uh, Ubidati manifesto on power. Give us a view of a foreigner who invests in power around the world and what they think of the position of a manifesto on power and see how we can really ratchet up this subject. Um, yeah, before uh, yeah. Jerome comes on, uh, I just want to make a few comments on the importance of power to economic uh, growth. You discover that um, uh, power constitutes uh, between 65 and 85% um, uh, of manufacturing component. Uh, recall, in Nigeria, in Nigeria. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you, you recall that uh, when uh, Lami Dosanusi was central bank governor, he gave uh, about 400 or 600 billion to the textile industry. Most of them rejected it. Hmm. He said, look, if there is no power, 
There's no way they're still going to use that money, money to generate the listen. The only way to make sense to them is when there is power. You know? And that's why the textile industry is still mm -hmm. comatous the way it is. You know? And there's a gentleman called Charlton. Um, he married he's a Canadian gentleman, married a daughter of uh, the Char Group uh, um, founder uh, of the Hong Kong uh, Chinese gentleman who built uh, the big textile mill in Kaduna okay, yeah. uh, back in the early 60s. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I was at a, a conference in Anse in France, uh, Europe Africa Summit, uh, and he was there, some African heads of state and, and all of this. And we we're talking about the challenges of African development. And he said, look, their factory could have been in the stratosphere, literally speaking, in terms of producing for export from Nigeria, but for power. Yeah. He even suggested a regional strategy where you can produce certain things in Mali, some in Ghana, because there are better places for power and mm -hmm. that, combined with Nigeria, and they could still be competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was go back to the mid 90s, mm -hmm. and we watched the textile industry, second biggest employer of labor in the country after government, literally just disintegrate. Um, Policy, trade policy, yeah. was so badly managed through the years. And so one of the things that the Obidati team is going to focus on, uh, and frankly, Rezis even talked about fiscal policy issues, trade policy is so critical to competitiveness. Yeah. Uh, this, interestingly, a Chinese uh, um, born lady, who's, I guess she's American now, in Mac at McKinsey, uh, Irene Sun, who has studied this whole thing, has written this book uh, on um, uh, Africa, the, next, the world's next factory. And she talks about the failure of trade policy in Nigeria and how it led to the collapse of the textile industry. We must be able to get the best Nigerians around the world who understand trade policy. Interestingly, a Nigerian is now the CEO at the World Trade um, uh, WTO. WTO. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, um, I think that her role there should be helpful to help him build capacity in trade policy, which has been a major bane of the Nigerian economy.